the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our God, in your plan of salvation for us, you healed the leper, cleanse our bodies and our souls from every sin, in thought and in deed, and sanctify our spirits with your Holy Spirit. May we glorify you with purity and with holiness and give thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the eternal Word who took flesh and became like us in all things but sin, to the Creator of all who appeared in the world as the physician, and to heal the sick in body and in soul. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. O Christ, our God, physician of souls and of bodies, in your plan of salvation you had pity upon the leper who was an outcast, and you healed him by your word. We lift up our eyes and our hearts to you at all times, and we implore you never to keep your mercy and grace away from us but to look upon us with compassion as you did with the leper. Cleanse us and make us holy. Now, O Lord, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to stretch forth your hand and have compassion upon us. For you have said, Ask and it will be given to you, Seek, and you who shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. With unfailing hope, we implore you to forgive all our sins in your love and to heal us in your grace. Accept those who repent and bring back those who have gone astray. Console the grieving and strengthen the weak. Satisfy the hungry and provide for those in need. Bless those who are generous and enrich them with good deeds. Remember the departed who have gone to their rest hoping in you. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
physician after you healed the leper. You told him to go and show himself to the priest and to make an offering. Now with the fragrance of this incense, we offer ourselves unto you as an offering pleasing to you. In your mercy accept it from us and protect us. We glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <speaking in Hebrew> Christ our Lord, our physician, now have, you have made the leper clean. Now we beg you to heal us. By your word, forgive our sins. Lord our God, you accepted what the just had offered you. Now accept in your mercy of your sacrifice. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, Therefore, sin must not reign over your mortal bodies so that you obey their desires. And do not present the parts of your bodies to sin as weapons for wickedness, but present yourselves to God as raised from the dead to life and the parts of your bodies to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin is not to have any power over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Of course not. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that although you were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the pattern of teaching to which you were entrusted. Freed from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms, 
because of the weakness of your nature. For just as you presented the parts of your bodies as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness for lawlessness, so now present them as slaves to righteousness for the sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what profit did you get then from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit that you have leads to sanctification. And its eternal end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Mark, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Mark writes, And rising very early, before dawn, Jesus left and he went off to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him came after him, and upon finding him they said, Everyone is looking for you. And he told them, let us go to the nearby villages, so that I may preach there also, for this is the purpose for which I have come. And so he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. And the leper came up to him and kneeling down begged him and said to him, if you desire, you can make me clean. And moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, and he touched him, and he said to him, I do will, be made clean. And the leprosy left him immediately, and he was made clean. Then, warning him sternly, he dismissed him at once. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for giving us his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
and warning him sternly, he dismissed him. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. The first, this is the beginning of the Gospel of St. Mark. It's the very first chapter. And the first chapter of St. Mark begins with this flurry of activity of our Lord. So you have the witnessing. St. Mark begins, he talks about John the Baptist, the first four disciples. And then he has a whole section talking about our Lord going around and all the miracles and the healings and everything that is done. And then he tells the story about Peter's mother-in-law, specifically her being healed. And of course, this is connected because St. Mark is the interpreter for St. Peter. So when we read the Gospel of St. Mark, we're essentially reading the Gospel of St. Peter, his teaching. And so you have this one episode that no one else records, which is the healing of his mother-in-law, who was sick with fever at home and bedridden, and our Lord raises her up. That's the whole context that leads up to today's gospel. And there are one other thing to note on this. St. Mark is doing this, not just his connection with Peter, but it's also, he's writing it for the Romans. He's writing this letter. Some say Romans, some say the people of Alexandria. But he's putting it down for people who historically have no Jewish connection. They're pagans, historically. And so he doesn't spend a lot of time on, there's not a lot of quotations from the prophets. When you read the Gospel of St. Matthew, it's written for Jewish converts. And it's just just chock full of quotations from the prophets, which don't mean anything to those of pagan background, or at least not as much. And so what St. Mark does is he shows our Lord's advent, his coming, his arrival, as being one of power and of healing. That is the first chapter. That the pagans, everyone can understand healing. Everyone can understand power. Everyone can understand that presence then of God in the world. So that is the context of chapter one. And that's why we're told when the disciples come to look for our Lord, he he goes off to a deserted place, we're told. That's the beginning of today's gospel, right? It says that our Lord gets up early before dawn, before anyone else is up. And he goes off to pray in a place that there's nobody around. It's, des- it's deserted. Because at this point, as we can see in the gospel, everyone knows about this rabbi. Our Lord has gone all around Galilee. He's been preaching. He's been teaching. He's in the synagogues. He's everywhere. You have the miracle of Capernaum, of, of Peter's mother-in-law. And that's why when our Lord rises, he goes off to a place where there's no one else. He's been jostled around enough over these days. But that's why Peter then goes out with some of the other disciples, perhaps all, all four of them at this point. We don't know. But in any case, Peter says to him, everyone's looking for you. So this is why you have this context today. And now we're told that our Lord continues to preach all around Galilee. So what happens is it becomes the ferment becomes more and more and more intense of people coming out. And that when the sun goes down and it's the end of the Sabbath, even on the Sabbath day, they're dragging all of the sick out to our Lord. So it's a very beautiful image, but it's power and it's healing. This is the whole teaching that's taking place, which is why it's been been chosen for the second Sunday of Lent. It's reminding us of what we're doing actually during the great fast, which is seeking healing. It's not causing pain, flogging ourselves, giving up cookies. Those types of things are only means. The main purpose that we seek is healing. And that's why this leper, I began with the quotation that our Lord, our Lord warns him sternly, we're told in this translation, and then he sends him away. But I've given you the rest of the context of the gospel in the bulletin, the, the continuation to the end of the chapter that our Lord tells him you are to go and show yourself to the priest. We have that reflected in the gospel and in the Husoyo. But then sending him away, he tells him, you go and you make the sacrifice that's mentioned in Leviticus. You go to the temple, you show yourself to the priest for the priest to give testimony that you've been healed. It's the law of Moses, quite simply. And then he tells him also sternly, you are to tell no one about this miracle which of course, being human, he does exactly the opposite. And he starts just blabbing away about the miracle. One, because it's to the glory of this great rabbi. And also, well, you know, it was a miracle for me. Ah, Yeah, you know, everyone likes to tell stories of the graces they receive, especially when they're big stuff. Very human. 
But what it then says by the end of the chapter, it says because of that, his reputation got even bigger and larger and more extended so that our Lord could not even go into the villages. So he has to remain out in the wilderness. But every, what we're told by the end of the chapter is that everyone's coming from the four quarters to see our Lord. That's end of chapter one. There will be 16 chapters in St. Mark. That's the beginning of the whole event. Now our Lord warns him severely because this man has actually violated the law of Moses because he came into the village to see our Lord. And under leprosy and the law of Moses, you were not allowed to be in public with other people. And you also had to ring a bell and warn people if you had to go into town. You had to warn them. And this leper apparently is doing, we're not told anything about a bell or anything else. We're just told he comes up and he throws himself down at our Lord's feet. This man who is maimed, who has mutilated hands, likely missing his nose, the man is completely mutilated. That's what leprosy does. And for the fathers of the church and through the prophets of the Old Testament, leprosy has always been the sign of sin and what sin does, corrupting from the inside out. And so leprosy has retained this imagery. And for the idea of contamination, because of course we don't, they didn't know. We now know that it's bacterial, I think, maybe a virus. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It's respiratory, most likely. But 95% of people who are exposed to it actually don't contract it. That's the disease. But because it works from the inside out and mutilates and deforms and eventually kills, it is the perfect image of sin that begins from the inside and works its way out. So all last week, the Gospels, and yesterday, especially Friday and Saturday, the Gospels together, our Lord is talking about hypocrisy and the wolves and ra the, the ravening wolves in sheep's clothing. Those are two different things. When we use the term hypocrite, it just means actor. It's those people who limp through life on one saying, wanting to be at least to appear Christian. I mean, they really do want to be Christian. But inside, they surf the web, they do all these things, they're influenced constantly by the world, they think like the world, and then try to like thumbtack a rosary onto it occasionally. It's miserable. Because what they are inside and what they are outside are two different things. Or at least not integrated, let's say that. That's a hypocrite. Our Lord's not saying they're evil. He's just saying they, they limp along in life, mutilated, because they're not actually being renewed interiorly. They know they need to go to Mass. They know they need to do these things. But see, with hypocrisy, one side's going to win. We're either going to pull the whole thing together by grace and actually become that devoted disciple of our Lord, or we're just going to side with the interior and say, ah, oh, you know, it's all stupid. You all had cousins who said that in the 70s, right? Oh, I don't get anything out of Mass, so it's just hypocrisy for me to go. So I don't go anymore. All right, so the inside one. You're not a hypocrite anymore. You're just a pagan. That simplifies it, true. But that's not exactly what our Lord had in mind when he talked about integration. It wasn't to degrade the whole thing down to paganism. It was to bring the integrity between the two. That's hypocrisy. In the modern, and I bring it up because in the modern terminology, a hypocrite is someone who is purposely trying to deceive you. But that's not what it means in the gospel. In the gospel, the one who's trying to deceive you by outward appearances, that's the wolf in sheep's clothing. That's someone who is very clearly, has no intention to become a sheep. They just have their own agenda, a wolf. That's a different thing. That our Lord doesn't even talk about in the context of his disciples. He talks about in the context of his disciples, hypocrisy, because it's just an actor. It's just the problem that we run into. And if we don't run into it on our whole life, we run into it on individual aspects of our lives, things that we really wouldn't want everyone else to know. And that's okay, because that's what humans do. We're wounded. The question is, is how do we actually move forward and have this leprosy of sin be healed? So our Lord sternly rebukes the man, and that's also why he tells him, tell no one. 
because it's going to implicate this man in having violated the law of Moses. And the second thing is, of course, our Lord touches him. To touch a leper under the Mosaic law is to become ritually unclean, unfit to be in the temple, to be part of the sacrifices at the temple. So our Lord himself with this man who approaches him shows him compassion and he touches him. These are the sacraments in the mystical body of Christ, this touching of Christ that is brought to us, the Eucharist, the pouring of water in baptism, the anointing in chrismation, the anointing within extreme unction. This is the hand of God coming down to heal us of our leprosy. And so there are a number of things that take place here. But what I'd like to leave you with is we can't escape from the hypocrisy of the acting until we are radically determined to integrate our life wholly within the grace of Christ. Our lives will always be divided. It reminds me of the old Catholic journal that was written for about 10 years in the 1940s, 1950s, called Integrity. I highly recommend if you find copies, and a former student of mine is actually working on reprinting all of these Catholic works um, under the writings of Carol Jackson. But there you had one of the co-founders was also a cartoonist. Very nice, very simple, and very meaningful. And one of his pictures shows the modern man with his cross. But the cross is an air mattress. And he's all curled up sleeping. He's just all curled up on it sleeping. That is his cross in a 1940s Catholic world. But pertinent to our discussion of hypocrisy today, our consideration of hypocrisy and healing of leprosy, of our sins, he does a picture where you have the man in the modern world where he has one hand nailed to the cross of Christ on this side, and on this hand he's holding his bag of money or whatever it is, and in between the two, you have this chasm splitting open between his legs as he has one foot that he tries to keep with the gospel and one foot that he's, you know, he's happy about his attachment to the world. And of course, he's going to be ripped apart by this. Mr. Business went to Mass. He never missed a Sunday. Mr. Business went to hell for what he did on Monday. It's another one of the same cartoonists wrote this jingle. Under some of them, they would have jingles. There was an article known as the League of St. Liniment, written originally in 1937 as an analysis of how organized sports was going to be the destruction of Catholic universities. Just think Notre Dame in the 40s. What is Notre Dame known for? Exuberant, radiant Catholicism or the fighting Irish? You answer the question. And so the hypocrisy is the idea of trying to appear something and but trying to be something else and all of this division. It is, the, it is the leprosy that begins within us and then erupts out through the skin, causes numbness in the skin, and eventually brings about death. Mr. Business went to hell for what he did on Monday because he never reconciled what he does on Sunday with the rest of his business week. And this was already being, these were young people. These were, these were young Catholics in their 30s and their 40s writing these articles, analyzing the modern Catholic world using the principles of St. Thomas Aquinas. They are brilliant. They're well worth reading if you can find them. But what I want to leave you today is this is the reason for the importance of the daily practice of the examination of conscience, why we do it. It is a prayer. It is not navel-gazing. It is not toting up a grocery list or a laundry list. It is the turning towards the Lord daily. And usually most people do it in the evening. Where actually there's a form to it as a prayer. You place yourself before the majesty of God. And yesterday with the parable of the Pharisee and the publican in the temple, we were able to talk about this aspect of standing before God in knowledge, conscious awareness of my need for his mercy. Not something that I just read in a prayer, 
but a profound understanding that I need to be healed. It is the prayer of the leper today. If you choose, if you desire, you can make me clean. That is the beginning, that is the examination of conscience. So that we place ourselves before the Lord God and we ask for his grace to illuminate our souls that I may see him as he sees me. And then I look over my day, all of my thoughts, my words, my actions, and the things that I have omitted that I should have done today. That's the stuff of the examination of conscience, if you like, but it's not the purpose. The purpose is knowledge. The purpose is an awareness that my hands are wounded, my face is falling apart, I am numb because of the sins that radiate le leprously throughout my body. If we do not do the practice of the examination of conscience, we really have no awareness of who we are. And then because we spend 98% of our time surfing the web and looking at screens, then we begin just to think like the pagans. And then we have the idea like all the pagans of, well, I'm a really good person. Like I told you, I have never heard that so much as I have heard in the last five years, people just telling me how good they are. While, you know, it, it's amazing. It doesn't mean you have to walk around pounding your chest with a rock and saying, I'm, I'm evil and wicked. But, you know, it's a little over the top to walk around saying I'm a really good person. So self-knowledge is comes what develops through the examination of conscience. It is what allows us to come to the self-knowledge so that, for example, when we go to confession, why, when we're in confession, we give numbers, we get, or at least rough estimates. I do this once a week. I do this once a month. Not just reading off just topics of sins, but I do these things. And again, it's not because God needs to know numbers. God knows exactly, better than we do, the perversion of our choices and the depth of our leprosy. He knows that. But it is the recognition, it is the embarrassment of walking through the middle of the crowd as a leopard and throwing yourself down before this miracle-working rabbi and saying, if you choose this, you can make me clean. That is the examination of conscience. That is the sacrament of penance. Now, obviously, we don't go to confession every single day, but we can do the examination of conscience every single day. And then when we've looked over that day, then yes, we make that act of contrition. The act of contrition, the word contrition in Latin literally means busted up, broken up. Contritus, broken, detritus. Right? Detritus, broken things floating all over after the hurricane. It means the tree, the, the tree today is the breaking up of something. Contritus means I am totally broken up. Why am I totally broken up? Because I realize my leprosy. But you don't stop there again. That's not the reason for it. The leper doesn't say I'm a leper, so please leave me sick. It, no, it's to make me whole, to make me clean, to make me healthy. And that in the Eastern Church is definitely what grace is about. It's not juridical. It's not just about the state of sin or the state of grace. It's about the therapeutic healing that takes place on a daily basis to those who wish it. To those who don't want it, well, you just go home, stop treatment and die. That's what we do. And at the end of that examination of conscience and the act of contrition, what we do then is we ask for the grace to do better tomorrow. We ask for the grace to improve. And when you do this on a regular basis, it only takes you a couple minutes. It's not like it takes you an hour. Now, in the beginning, it may take you an hour. I can't remember what I did at work this morning at 9 o'clock. What was 10? What did I do for lunch? I can't remember what I ate for lunch. I'd say, oh, was I with somebody? Oh, oh, that conversation was bad. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that one. Okay. Yes, it may take an hour when you first begin, but what you will find is when you practice the examination of conscience daily, you will know exactly where you're looking. Your knowledge of your leprosy, our knowledge of our leprosy, will become very pinpointed. 
and very aware of who we are and what kind of people we are. In other words, we begin to discover what is the distinction between the mask we wear in hypocrisy and what we are actually being leprously under that mask. And again, hypocrisy is not evil in itself. It just means we're not integrated, we're not whole, we're not healed. And that's why we try to bring all of these things together. We place it before the Lord in the daily examination of conscience. And we ask for the grace and the strength to do better. But of course, now I am consciously aware of what it is that I need to be working on. Not a generic mishmash of, well, I could do that better. And uh, yeah, I shouldn't do that. It's like, well, <sighs> but it's all right. And I usually console myself by knowing someone else who does it worse. And of course, that's just backwards. That's just psychologically, it just drives the disease deeper into me. The ones that we compare ourselves are not the, the, the bigger loser that I know than I am. The comparison that I make is to the saints, those who have been healed. And the fact that our Lord yanked out someone like St. Mary Magdalene right off the bat from the beginning of the gospel, none of us have an excuse. Every life can turn around. Every life filled with leprosy, with sin, can be healed. That is the consolation of today's gospel. So, in this second week of Lent, in our fasting, in our seriousness, redouble our efforts into the examination of conscience. And for those who, haven't done, who don't do the examination, do it. You'll find it is totally liberating. It is freeing. It is no less harmful to you than having been in the doctor's office with a prognostication and a diagnosis that gives you a path to being healed. That is exactly what the examination of conscience is. Do it well, and you will be healed like the leper. May God grant us the strength and the courage to do likewise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the most blessed mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the chosen one, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Conan. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. security make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss 
in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. To your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. before you to receive your blessings and assistance for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all we raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever Amen. O lord may the light of your face shine upon us deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you, and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim. Oh, 
Alkosu, Damsichro, Men Hamro, Men Mahayo, Barechu Kodenshen, Uyabil Talmita, Karomara, Sabishtaw, Mene, Kulukhun, Hono Denita, Demo Dila, Diati, Kichdato, Dahlo faikun wachlov sagie, mete shadu metihem. Hosoyon, chome wa hoye dan chaulam alamin. Amin. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your O oh Lord, we remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. Sessions and our prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Conan, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone through their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. strengthen and you encourage us for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Amen. Bow your heads before. 
before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins. For you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
again and again we thank you, O Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body to you. In your living blood to drink, lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, O Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokolokhunna. O Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your cross, be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, 
and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So there will be no public Masses Tuesday through Friday. We'll have the next Mass will be as usual on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.